Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another week of Bible study. I am super excited to be here with you guys. I know what you're thinking. Again, it's Bianca again. Where is our pastor? If you're not, if you're not, it's okay, you guys. He's fine. Um, uh, pastor Chandler and Lady Chandler are away celebrating their 36th anniversary. That is a blessing, blessing, blessing. So if you guys would like to drop well wishes or congratulations in the chat for them, um, I'm sure it will bless them to be able to see later. Uh, but with that being said, I have been tasked with teaching you on tonight. And as always, it is an honor to be able to do so. Uh, so again, greetings to you from us at Shady Grove First Missionary Baptist Church. On behalf of Pastor Chandler, uh, we are going to get started with tonight's lesson. Uh, but first and foremost, as always, we are going to kick off with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for another opportunity to come together and study your word. We thank you for the ways in which you will reveal yourself to us in this designated time that we will be able to glean from your word, grow from your word, and apply it to our daily living. Thank you for all that you've done, what you're doing right now, and the great things that you have in store for us, that your mercies are new every day, that your promises are yes and amen. So we humble ourselves now and we are ready to receive in the the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Like I said, I'm super happy to be here with you guys. Um, as I know that we'll have a few more people coming in, I like to start today with just a little bit of wraparound of what we covered last week um, and what we will be talking about on tonight. Uh, so it's it's been fun. Last week we covered a uh, careful where you share. Last Wednesday night that was our topic, and we came from Genesis chapter thirty seven verses uh, one through ten, and we talked about the importance of uh, sharing what God has shown you in safe places, being mindful of who you discuss things with, being mindful uh, that everybody is not rooting for you, everybody is not on team success of you. Um, and then on Thursday at noon, we continued that study uh, by looking at could have been another way. Uh, because as we continued looking at the story of Joseph, we covered that actually his brothers had a plot to kill him, uh, not just to sell him into slavery. So sometimes we become discouraged or disgruntled in the situations that we are in, not realizing that we have been protected from danger seen and unseen. And that because God is good and because he's faithful and because he takes Takes care of his children um, that we are kept. So it could have been another way. Uh, so tonight I'm excited to pick up uh, with the story of Joseph and we're going to be coming from chapter 39 of Genesis. So I'll give you a time to open it. We'll be coming from Genesis chapter 39 and our title for tonight is I'm with, I'm with him. I'm with him. I want to bring y'all's brain to something real quick. Uh, you know the benefits and the perks of knowing other people, right? Uh, we've all had the moment where it may have been a blessing to be able to name drop or to say, hey, I'm familiar with this place. or I'm familiar with these people. I've been here before. I've done this before. Or like in college, when y'all used to go out, when we used to go out and you'll be waiting in line, but because you know somebody at the front of the line, you get to skip everybody just off of the sole benefit of, hey, I know that person. And usually when you get to the front, they'll be like, whoa, whoa, where are you coming from? And you go, oh, I'm with her or oh, I'm with him. And then all of a sudden you get to skip the line or you get to get uh, into rooms that you might not have been in or you get to elevate to places that you might not have been. And I, I mean, listen, I got a testimony for y'all uh, that I can't even share right now. But there are, are things that God does that when God does it, you know, it ain't nobody but God. There's doors that open and you know it ain't nobody but God. Places that you get to go and you know it ain't nobody but God. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, it's the people that you meet along the way. It's the way that God aligns, arranges, puts you in the right places with the right people at the right time for the right things that it all aligns up. But you know that this orchestration is nothing but God. And that just excites me to think about because as we pick up the story right now with Joseph, if we think back to what we spoke about, that it could have been another way. It could have been another group of people that would have ultimately not brought Joseph to Egypt. It could have been uh, people who would have met him 
no good. It could have been that his brothers killed him. It could have been that he got lost in the wilderness. It could have been all of these other things. But instead of it being those situations, God worked it out that it was the right people to bring him to the right places to do the right things because I'm with him. I'm, I'm with that guy. I, I know him. So as we get ready to jump into tonight's lesson, find me in Genesis chapter 39. Chapter 39. We are covering a whole lot of scripture tonight. Uh, but if you have a notebook out, if you're taking notes and following me, we're going to look at tonight's lessons through three lenses, okay? We're gonna look at God's presence we're going to look at given prosperity and we're going to look at guided placement. OK, God's presence, given prosperity and guided placement. These are going to be important as we study tonight's lesson. So let's look at our first batch of scriptures. We're going to be coming through uh, verses one through five. Joseph's success in Egypt. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him before the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And now his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him the overseer of the house and put him in charge of all that he owned. And it came about that from the time he made him an overseer in his house and all over that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. So the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. This is a beautiful portion of scripture. Fear not. I'm going to tell you why, because that is why we are here. So verses one through five of this, again, we have Joseph that he has been taken to Egypt and he becomes uh, a servant to Potiphar. This is important because if we look at this in the studying sense of what Potiphar uh, means, traditionally, it is used as a title, uh, as someone who is the captain of the bodyguard. So he's not in the king's, he's in the Kingsman court, but this particular man um, is like the big guy in charge of being the bodyguard. And now Joseph has been given to him as um, a servant. Also, though, why else we know that this is important is because while this is typically used as a title, in Potiphar's case, it is emphasized and um, grammatically presented with a capital letter P, which lets us know that he did his job so well. He was so official. He was it of the it's that it was written and, and, and logged as his name. OK, so Potiphar was that dude. Potiphar was important. Potiphar mattered. Potiphar made sure that the things happened, okay? And so here we have Joseph being uh, the servant to Potiphar. And he brought him before the Ishmaelites, who are the people who brought him down there. And it tells us for the first time here that the Lord was with Joseph. Let me tell you why this is important. It's important because um, in this one chapter of scripture, it is mentioned four times that the Lord was with Joseph. So if again, if you're taking notes, this is note number one, okay? In verse two, it says that the Lord was with Joseph and it is a declarative statement when this is said. And we know that when God speaks, that settles it. So if it's spoken that God was with Joseph, nothing is changing it. As we've talked about uh, our theme being for this year with the church, it's been released because once God has said something, that's it. So shall it be because once God has said something, that's it. So we find Joseph in Egypt under uh, the leadership of a guy that's a pretty big deal and favor has already found him. And it says, because the Lord was with Joseph, he became a successful man and he was in the house of the master Egyptian. Also an important detail, this is not typically what happens. The servants were not in the homes of the people. Joseph has already found so much favor that he doesn't have to live in a hut like the rest of the servants. He's inside the king's guard's house, chilling, running everything, okay? Verse three, here's the second time. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused everything that he did to prosper in his hand. So one, the first time was a, declar a, de a declarative statement 
that God was with him. But the second time we have it that others are able to see. So it's now becoming visible by other people. How do we know? It says because the master saw how everything he did was blessed because God saw to making sure that was true. God made it happen. And again, I've told you guys that the Old Testament is not just stories for us to read. The Old Testament is an opportunity for us to see, study, and apply these things to our own lives. So what does it mean that in the Old Testament, where there had not yet been the promise of the Savior coming, while there had not been the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside, if we were able to see what that favor looks like just from God being with Joseph, what does it look like for us as believers who have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit? You have the indwelling presence of God himself stuff on the inside of you. You don't think favor finds you? You don't think God makes ways just for you? Opens doors just for you? Dries up oceans just for you? Does the impossible just for you? Oh, yes, he will. Because once God speaks it, that's already it. And then he does it in a way that other people can't help but to see his glory. I don't know about you, but that excites me. That excites, that excites me. Okay, so when we get into verse four and five, uh, Joseph is so favored at this point that not only is he brought into the house, he becomes the overseer of all of the other servants. <laughs> and he's put in charge. And so not only is he the over, let, let's keep tracking this. He was the favored brother by his father. So much so that his brothers wanted him dead. Then they decided, okay, let's not kill him. Let's sell him for 30 pieces of silver and put him in jail. He goes from being um, in prison, like he goes from being taken as a, sa a slave to be made into a servant in the Kingsman Guard. He finds favor there that now he's in control of all of the other servants and all of the other things. But then it goes on to also tell us that it wasn't, it wasn't just over the people. It says over everything that he owned and the Lord blessed the Egyptians house because of Joseph. So the Lord's blessing was on everything he owned in the house and in the field. Understand this. Other people around you are blessed simply from you showing up. Simply from your favor, God blesses so much with so much overflow and oil and favor that it doesn't bless just you. It has a ripple effect. It's so oily that it just slides everywhere. Y'all know how it is when you get out the shower and your oil feet, then you got to walk like this so you don't slip and slide because the oil just oiling, the favor just favoring. You're just sliding on all over the place, blessings everywhere galore. It's beautiful. But, you know, we talked about last week, you, you got to be careful. You got to watch because everybody, everybody isn't for you. So here again, we have God's presence equaled the prosperity that was given that equaled guided placement. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we may read this and our assumption becomes, but I mean, that's nothing to celebrate because he was a servant. But don't miss the fact that he could have been dead. We get upset sometimes because, Lord, this is not the place I thought I would be. This isn't really what I wanted. This isn't what I saw for myself. This isn't what I imagined. This isn't the way that I thought you would work it out, Lord. I don't really know why am I supposed to be excited about this. And God said, be excited because I'm with you. God said, be content because I'm going to cause you to prosper. Be be thrilled that I've placed you where I have because it's for a bigger picture and for the blessing of others because it ain't always just about you. So let's look at verses 6 through 11. So he left, so this is Potiphar. Potiphar left Joseph in charge of everything that he owned. And with them, he, and with him, there he did not concern himself with anything except the food in which he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So let's focus on the uh, on part A of that before we go on. Potiphar trusts Joseph so much. He sees the favor so much in Joseph that he puts him in charge of every single thing that he owns. 
The only thing Potiphar had to worry about was what am I going to eat tonight? This is the king's guard. Understand Joseph's placement gave him authority over stuff that was not his business. Joseph is running things that he really shouldn't even be touching. I tell my clients that when I'm training in leadership and pushing for co, I'm, I, I try to say, you will look around you one day and realize that your resume does not match where you are. Your credentials does not match where you are because a lot of times we, we think that in order to be at one place or to run down one to-do list or in order to be able to achieve these things, society says, I need this, 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 and this. Joseph running a whole operation and he's supposed to be just a servant. And God does that with us. He will place us in places, give us what we need, the wisdom, the skill set, the task, the ability to do up, to do it and to show up. It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what it should look like. It doesn't matter what, what the condition should be. God does what he wants to do. His presence gives prosperity and it gives placement. And we can't waste time questioning those things or being concerned about if I'm worthy of it. We can't waste time being concerned about uh, uh, if, if, am I good enough? Can I keep paying? That's not the question. It's God's presence. It's the prosperity that he gives. And it's the placement that you've been placed in. It's not coincidental. He doesn't make mistakes. It's not coincidental. He doesn't make accidents. He's the great orchestrator, Alpha and Omega, beginning it in the end. Elohim, the master creator, is not an accident. And just because the title isn't the title that you want, servant doesn't sound lovely. Do not get distracted by the titles that you have. Be mindful of the tasks that God has given you. Titles and tasks don't touch, it don't matter. Your title does not matter. The assignment does. And Joseph understood the assignment. Why do we know, okay? Because it says that he did everything. Joseph took that blessing and ran with it, full speed ahead. We're picking up at part B of verse six. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. The Bible said Joseph was fine, y'all. Verse seven says, and it came about after these events that his master's wife had her eyes on Joseph and she told Joseph, sleep with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look with me here, okay? My master does not concern himself with anything in this house and he has put me in charge of all that he owns. There is no one in this house greater than I am. And he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. And now it happened one day that when he went to the house to do his work and none of the people in the household were inside, we gonna come back to the rest of that verse, okay? So the Bible tells us that Joseph was looking good and Joseph came into the house and Potiphar's wife was trying to get with Joseph. And Joseph said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Behold, my master don't have to worry about nothing in this house. He trusts me. He has given me free range to do this, that, and the third, but not fool with you. The only thing that has been withheld here is you. So tell me why would I go and do a thing like that and sin against God? While this seems like just a juicy piece of text, there's a lesson here. Pay attention. God gives you territory. God trusts you with something. An assignment, a task, a duty, a work, a group of people that requires integrity. God will open many, many doors. 
He will allow you to walk through them. He will allow you to enjoy them. He will make ways that no man can shut. And your job and duty, my job and duty, our job and duty is to know what are the untouchables. We can't get so high and mighty, so biggity, so, so, so proud and arrogant that we forget that if boundaries have been set, if hitting the boundaries, do what you're supposed to do. Sometimes we go, oh, okay, well, you know, he did say everything was mine. No, 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 no. Why am I spending time on this? Because God's presence, given prosperity, guided placement. We talked about last week being mindful of where you share because everybody's not rooting for you. And that applies everywhere you go. Miss Lady Potiphar's wife was not, she was not, she didn't, in her brain, this is a servant. I could do whatever, say whatever, and get whatever I want. She didn't expect him to say no. How do we know? Because if you keep looking at the other verses, she got a little upset that he ignored her. Verse 12, so she grabbed him by his garment and got forceful. She said, sleep with me. But he ran out of his clothes. He left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said, see, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make fun of us. He came to me in my, to sleep with me and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. So she left his garment beside her until the master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, a Hebrew slave who you brought to us came in to me to make fun of me. But when I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Again, here's a lesson. Here's a lesson and do not miss it. Last week, we spoke of the importance of people know who you are. Now, when she liked him and she wanted to be with Joseph, she ain't care that he was a Hebrew. They ain't never come out of mouth. She never mentioned it. This is why it's important when you're reading the word of God, if we're in Bible study, this is why it's important to know what grouping of people that you are talking about. Because again, this is a really, this becomes a battle of who, who, and it gets deeper than just, hey, he was trying to get at my wife. Let's talk about it. OK, for those of you who are not able to join us on Thursday, I told you that the importance of the brothers selling their the, the Joseph's brother selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites is if you look back at genealogy and the family tree that is happening here, we are looking at people who have come from Abraham's promise. You know, the promise when God told Abraham, hey, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Abraham got a little impatient and waiting. Abraham went and slept with the handmaid. In that, we got Ishmael. Ishmael was born before we got before we got Isaac. So we have Ishmael and Isaac. The descendants of Ishmael were still blessed because the promise was made to his mother at the at the when she was out in the wilderness when she ran away. That is how we learn God to be Elroy because he promised Hagar that hey, I will still take care of your son. But he also told Abram and Sarah, I ain't ever tell y'all to do that. So while the blessings and promises will still come through the two of you to Isaac, Ishmael's children are still blessed as well. So the Ishmaelites that you hear here are the opposing side of the family tree. So when you look at your power struggle here, the Ishmaelites are living very well in Egypt. How well? Well enough to have a king's guard. How well? Well enough that the bodyguard got servants. How well? Well enough that the servants can be supervised by another servant. The Ishmaelites are doing well. And then when you look into this and you realize that all of a sudden, when it didn't work the way that she wanted it to work, she started introducing Joseph as that Hebrew boy that you brought up in here. Follow me, people. Follow me, follow me. You are marked in the kingdom of God. 
People should know that you are a child of God by how you walk, how you interact, what your life's fruit looks like. You are a child of God. That should be evident in every interaction that you have in and out every day. It should be evident that you are a child of the most high king. But because people know who you are, there is a standard that is expected. There is a standard in which you are introduced in that when it works for them, it works for them. And when it doesn't work for them, it doesn't work for them. How do you know? Oh, that's Bianca. She loved the Lord. She can pray to paint off walls. Oh, girl, that's Bianca. Don't ask her to come because you know she's saved. She can't. Mm -mm. There becomes a real clear line of divide of where you stand and who you are. But then sometimes people want to introduce you as that. But then sometimes two people introduce you as where you come from, who you are, what's at your core. So in the middle of her being bitter and mad, because make sure you know, just like save people know save people, demons know save people too. How do we know? In the New Testament. When Jesus is performing miracles, when he goes into the uh, 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 garden where the man who has been living in isolation and self-harming himself is full of a legion of demons, as Jesus walks closer, they know Jesus by name. They say, wait a minute, Jesus, don't come over here. The demons, that's a sign to you know your name too. Attacks of the enemy are real. We do not just fight in, fle in flesh and blood. There's realms out here, y'all. And when you do the integrity work of sticking to the kingdom, when you do the task, the assignment, the grind, the constant energy, when you are pushing and focusing on your salvation, you better believe that the enemy don't like it. And that's when the name calling start. She said that Hebrew. You brought that Hebrew up in here and he tried to touch me. You brought that Hebrew up in here and he tried to have his way with me. I'm an Ishmaelite. Oh my goodness. But see, when you're in the midst of God's presence, when it's he who gives you prosperity, when it's he who places you in the places, it does not matter what lies are told because God is still God. What does matter is how you show up in that moment. What does matter is how do you still stand on what you know? Joseph knew, okay? Joseph knew, look, girl, I can't play with you. You got to know what you can and can't do, where you can and can't go. Draw your lines, let them be. They not, they not going to like me if I say what I got. Say what you got to say then. Get a new friend. It's fine. They ain't going to fool with me no more if I don't go. Okay, well, guess what? Stay home sometimes. The major folks know it. She held that man closed and waited till her husband came home to fashion up this story. And then again, poor Joseph ends up in a situation where people may want to suspect, see, that just ain't fair. That just ain't right. That's just not, that's just, that's just, that's just. Let's look at the next portion of scripture. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me. His anger burned, grr, grr. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in prison, wait. Bianca, you just told us do what's right. He still ended up in jail. Bianca, you just told us to, to stick to our guns and let God be God, but he ended up in jail. Bianca, you just said that it's okay. Uh-huh, I did not stand on it. I stick to it. Because again, God is with him. I'm with him. I'm with him. I am with the Lord. All the rest of this just really ain't even matter right now. I don't even care. I don't care. I don't care. I am with the Lord. 
So she, he comes home and she tells him this story and he's angry. He's so mad that he throws him into prison. And here we go again, Lord Joseph in jail again. Lord Joseph then got in another situation. Y'all, let's, let's, let's be clear around what tradition says back then for this. An accusation of this magnitude could have gotten Joseph stoned to death. An accusation of this magnitude could have got Joseph killed in front of all of the other servants to make a statement of let's don't play with my life. We're talking Egyptian time where they are like in full uh, 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 entertainment where like killing people is entertaining for them. This is another one of those moments where Joseph could like just literally not be here anymore. And we have to get conditioned in our own faith that we have eyes in our situation to see that regardless of how sucky it looks, it is still divine orchestration. Y'all know me, I like to teach in transparency. I have been in this particular season that I am in for a long time. You may be wondering what that is. I'm gonna tell you, it's it, it's 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 probably a little more transparent than I need to be, but I'm, I'm gonna be transparent, okay? Full-time ministry, full-time leadership, 24 seven is not easy. My father and I talk a lot around boundaries, a, a lot around accessibility a lot around what does this need to look like when when is self-care time when do you cut off when do you do this when do you do that and i've noticed the pattern that a lot of people in my life this has started to become the conversation people are asking they're checking in they're asking the things and the situation the, the, the season had had began to reach a point where it started to feel like oh lord i'm being obedient i'm doing what you're asking me to do but i really don't know like well am i doing it right am i where i'm supposed to be am i am i exercising my faith correctly am i following your instructions the way you want am i implementing it so much that my brain started to feel like, woo, woo, woo. And it can become overwhelming. It can feel stressful, right? I want you to think about a season in your own life right now that you may be in or a situation. It may not even be a season, but whatever it is, think about it. Locate that thing. Find it. And you may be able to identify 16 different ways you wish it was different. You may be able to run down a whole list of how if if this would have equaled this, I should be here. Or if I did this like this, maybe I would have that. Or if I did make that mistake at this point. And what happens is we start all of these different lists of what ifs and how comes that we don't see exactly where God has placed us. We forget that his promise is I will be with you until the end of time. We forget that his promise is nothing can separate you from the love of God. We forget that his promise is that I will stick closer than a brother. We forget that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We forget it. Because our eyes can't help but see all of the other ways that we wish it was when God says, just enjoy my presence. Just trust that I will give you what you need with where I allowed you to be. Just trust my placement. Well, Lord, I mean, I do trust you. I've been trusting you my whole life, but I just don't know about this one. I just don't know. I trust you, Lord. I got faith and it's bigger than a mustard seed. But I really, I just, I, th I think maybe I messed up. And that's another thing I really want us to do as believers. Get past the point of feeling like certain placements is punishment. Our understanding of God is so skewed sometimes. We view him as wrathful and angry and like that anytime something doesn't go favorably, our assumption becomes that I must have done something wrong and now God is punishing me. 
Can you imagine how that must feel to God to know that he sits high, looks low, that all of his decisions have been made out of love, that the great sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross ultimately came from a heart posture of love. I love you. I've provided for you. I've given for you. I've sacrificed for you. I've allowed my son to die on the cross that when I see you, I don't see your sin. I see the blood of Jesus. But for whatever reason, you would assume that everything that I allow to happen, that I eventually work together for the good of you because you are my child, your assumption is that I'm punishing you. Man, that has to hurt as him sitting in the position of father who loves. It's not punishment, it's placement. And maybe your question is, why does the placement feel like punishment? Because purpose is attached to it. Why does the placement feel like punishment? Because purpose is attached to it. Promise is attached to it. And we hate process. We hate it. We hate the pain that comes with process. We hate to wait. We hate to struggle. We hate to have to watch God work it out. We hate to be held. We hate to be put in places where it feels as if I'm not moving forward. And God says, just shut up sometimes and let me love you where I have placed you. He literally put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a furnace and was with them. Provided protection for them. But it was the placement for other people to know that God was God. Come on. Your placement is attached to your purpose and your promise. How do I know? Because Jesus' presence came. He was the prosperity. And his placement up on the cross had to be painful. It was painful. Literally crucifixion. The word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. Excruciating pain upon a cross. God's presence. He literally presented him own self in the presence of prosperity and provision to be placed for promise and purpose. And you think you don't have to? So here we have Joseph doing nothing but what he was told to do. And now he finds himself in prison. But check this out, y'all. It's not even a regular prison. It says, verse 20, so Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. The king's prisoners. <laughs> He's still in a bougie jail. Our holding places aren't even the worst of the worst. Our situations aren't even as drastically horrible as they could be. Our pain is still not as distraught as it could be. And we miss it. We don't see it. We skip all over it. Because all we see is the prison. All we see is the situation. All we see is the heartache, the pain, the frustration. And it's still better than what it could have been. Ah, tonight's call is perspective shifting. God says there are disgruntled believers of, uh, 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 among you because they do not see what they want to see. So their faith suffers. 
They're not getting what they want to get. So their faith wavers. It's not working the way they want it to work. So their faith is losing its fire. Tonight is your call of action for your perspective to see that you are always in his presence, that he is always providing more than what you need, and he is putting you where you are, and that is fine. I'm with him. I'm walking in rooms I don't belong in because I'm with him. I'm standing on stages where my feet shouldn't be because I'm with him. I'm traveling places I never thought I would because I'm with him. I'm climbing mountains I never thought I would see because I'm with him. I'm overcoming struggles that I never thought I would kick because I'm with him. And you got to get your talk about yourself. You got to know that favor finds you because the Lord is with you. And once that happens, who, who can do anything about it? Yes, weapons will be formed, but they will not prosper. Why? Because God sits high. He looks low. He protects his children. And just because it's not the protection that you would have fashioned does not mean that God's way is not best. He's the God of generations. He's been doing this. He ain't new to it. Let's keep reading. I'll be getting excited. (sighs) Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. There it is. Time three. But the Lord was with Joseph um, and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. And the warden of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The warden of the prison did not supervise anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and the Lord made whatever he did prosper. Joseph get put in jail and now he run in the jail. He didn't found favor with the warden. He's in charge of all the other prisoners. Anything he want to do, sure, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, I think we should have a rodeo. Sure, Joseph, go ahead. Hey, I think we should do a cake sale. Sure, Joseph, go ahead. Anything Joseph wanted to do. The warden said, sure, Joseph, go ahead, because I see that God is with you. He ain't even supervised him. Everything in the jail was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and the Lord made whatever he did prosper. I told you that the Lord was with him was mentioned four times in this text. Let me give it to you again. In verse two, it is declaratively stated that God was with Joseph. What do we learn from that? That when God speaks, that settles it. Verse three, he was visibly blessed. The master was able to see it. What does that tell us? That God will allow other people to see you be blessed. Time 21, he's in prison and then everyone is blessed because of Joseph. Extended favor. Others benefit from the favor that you receive. Verse 23, this is important. Catch it. God gives you wide open territory. As I was studying for this lesson, I say, okay, God, that that's important. That's standing out and I need you to tell me why. So let's read it again. The warden of the prison did not supervise anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. The Lord made whatever he did prosper. When you are walking with God, when you align yourself with God, when you surrender to God's will, to God's way, to his presence, to his provision, to his prosperity, to his presence, to where he places you. When you surrender and let all of those things be, 
wide open territory. And here's the thing. God gives us space to step in. And we miss the opportunity to exist in the space correctly. Why? Because we're too mad about the space. God literally gives us wide open authority. He tells us, call those things that are not as though they are. He tells us to ask and he'll answer, seek and he'll be found, knock and the door will be open. He tells us that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He tells us that we have not because we ask not. He tells us that life and death lies in the power of the tongue. He tells us that I will be with you. He tells us that there are his promises uh, that he already knows about, plans for us to succeed and not to fail. He tells us all of these things that directly communicate territory and authority. And we don't exist in it because we're too busy throwing a fit about where he put us. I said, oh God, that's, that's, that's something. We too mad about the job that we have to realize that you have direct access to exemplify the love of God every day and potentially save a whole bunch of souls. But because you're mad, you show up every day whining and complaining, and now you're the example of the Christian that don't ever have contentment. How they work? You may be the one family member in a family full of heathens and hooligans that got yourself together, that has made it out of whatever struggle and situation. And you have a relationship with the Lord now, but you're too busy being mad at everybody that didn't hurt you, that didn't did you wrong, that you holding grudges against, that you can't seem to forgive, that you forget to use it as an opportunity to tell people about the goodness of God. So instead of helping your family get saved, everybody just stay heathens and hooligans. God has blessed you with strategy and wisdom that if you implemented it and shared it with other people, so many people could be free, but you enjoy the benefit of you receiving it that you hold it all to yourself and don't realize that you're holding up the gates of heaven. Come on. We sit right in the places that God has put us and we throw a fit in his face. A whole fit. I mean, I'm talking a three-year-old in Walmart stretched out on a flow fit. We mad. God, this is not what I prayed for. This is not what I asked for. This is not what I fasted for 40 days for. God, this is what you give me. This is the return of my sacrifice. And God says, shift your perspective. I am with you. I am giving you what you need to thrive here. Thrive here grow here build here trust me here and watch your territory it will grow it will expand you have to be a good steward of where he has placed you regardless of if it's what you thought it would be or not he does not make mistakes i know it sounds like i'm fussing y'all but right now i'm in my bag of authority look i gotta roll with what god has given I have planned this to sound a lot sweeter tonight, but the, the 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 sweetness ain't coming out. I'm sorry. It ain't, it is not, it's not flowing sweetly. But I hope that it is doing what it is supposed to do by pricking your heart, by tweaking your mindset, by challenging you and how you speak to your situations. Because Joseph never lost his favor. This is the same favor that has been with him since he was in the wilderness. He never lost his favor. In a pit, same favor. 
because instead of drying in the pit, dying and drowning in the pit, he was sold out of the pit. To the right group of people, still favor. To Egypt, still favor. To the king's guard, still favor. To prison, still favor. Your life, it may have been a hard childhood. You've still been protected and favored. You may have had an abusive husband. You've still been favored. You may have a wavered child, still favored. You may be dealing with grief and desperation, still favored. You may be dealing with a, a, a sadness and bondage, still favored. Why? Because you are still here. God has not forgotten about you. And you cannot lose sight over what he is doing because of where you are. It's divine placement. Start asking questions like, Lord, what am I to learn from this? What am I to do with this? How to show up? What is it that you need from me to do in this season where I am? How to take care of this territory? So often, we respond with our discontentment. Think about it. What if you were to answer, like what, what would the scales look like? If you praise God as often as you complain to him. How would it balance out if it was to be weighed your gratitude versus the moments that you grunt? Where, where will the chips fall? Lord, it seems like every time stuff start going good, here's another test. You probably right. You know why? Because you did well and survived the last. So let me let me go ahead and make another testimony out of you. Well, Lord, pick somebody else. Get somebody else to do it. You don't know what other people are dealing with. Everybody got their own test. They don't struggle. They don't strife. Life ain't easy. It's just not. But God's promises are true. He does not go back on his word. His presence is enough. He will cause you to succeed. He will make it happen for you. You don't think that everybody else looking at Joseph and know he a Hebrew too? You don't think everybody trying to figure out how he keep getting all of this Rule to do whatever he want to do. Even though it is not notated here, you better trust and believe that anytime somebody asks Joseph, he's sitting them down telling them, look, it ain't me, it's God. Well, who's God? Oh, well, let me tell you. That's the other thing we have to become disciplined in. How do you summarize your season? How do you report what you're experiencing? Careful where you share. God will give you the places where you can be raw, where you can be real, where you can say what the struggle is. But those places are places that are equipped and ready to pour back into you for strength, to pour back into you for boldness, to pour back into you to do it all again. But, but think about it. How do you summarize where you are? How do you run down the story? If your life right now had a six o'clock spot on WFB tonight, what do you stand behind the desk and introduce as the anchor? Is your statement, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have an amazing story for you of the way that I have survived trial after trial after trial, and I am here to report to you my testimony. Stay tuned. Or when the news comes on, are you dimming the lights and it's doom, gloom, shaboom, and anything else that the people are willing to listen to? How do you recap where you are? 
The phones now give us an opportunity to drop a pin where we are or our location to share with other people. If you drop the pin right where you are right now, what is it that you will say about God's presence? Is it that you know he's with you or are you feeling a little left and alone? If your response is left and alone, check your perspective because God does not abandon his children. Get around some people who can remind you God does not abandon his children. It may be hard, but you're not doing it by yourself. It may feel like a long road, but you're not walking it alone. It may feel worrisome, but God says, cast your cares upon me because I care. If you have to drop a pen at your location, what are you saying about the prosperity that you have? That in other places it may look like lack, but you have good health. It may look like lack, but you have a sound mind. It may look like lack, but God makes sure that every need that you have is met. If you were to drop a pin right now at the place that God has you, how do you introduce your placement? What comes out of your mouth matters because it's a reflection of your heart. It's a reflection of your heart. And again, God's push tonight is to watch your perspective. The word tells us four times because God was with him. And again, tonight our title is, and I'm with him. But are you? From your mouth, is that same declaration true? When others see you, is that same declaration true? Can other people benefit from the overflow of your faith? Can other people benefit from the overflow of your favor because of your faith? Be clear, favor is a byproduct of faith. It's the overflow. It's the unmerited glory. Is your response the same? That God can trust you with territory. That God can trust you with authority. Because you know that God is with you and you are with him. Like the song says, where do you stand? Who is on the Lord's side? Well, I feel like I didn't fuss and yell enough on tonight. <laughs> um, anytime we come into the space, we are careful to acknowledge that everybody who comes to listen may not be a believer. Everybody may not. Uh, uh, probably like, you know, we can't assume that everyone has um, given their heart to Christ. So we always like to take this time to offer Christ to each and every one of you. As I said earlier, I'm pretty sure it was not easy to place himself upon the cross. But that was the plan. It was orchestrated and divinely done so that all of us can have salvation. So our request tonight is the same that it is every week, that if you want to give God your hand, if you want to give God your heart, even if you just have a few questions and really want to just understand and know, as I always encourage, feel free, send me a message, send me a comment, DM. I, I manage the, the Facebook page, okay? So if you guys send the message, it's still me who answers, okay? So if you have a question, send your question. If you want to talk about a few things, if you want to figure it out, I am here for you. Um, we just want to offer Christ to you. If you want to give God your hand, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your savior, um, the prayer is simple. It's a confession of your mouth and belief in your heart that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and lives just for you. Also, we're going to pray together as a family. And tonight my prayer will be specific. My prayer will be that our hearts 
will gain new perspective, new, new eyes, the ability to see that God's presence is always with us, that his promises and his prosperity is there. And that regardless of the placement that he has put us, it is fine. It is well. God is good. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. Why? Because he cares too much about each and every one of us, because we're all a part of a bigger, brighter, better plan. So Lord God, right now we come to you and we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, you being good. We thank you for you being God. We thank you that even when it doesn't feel like it, we can trust that you are always in control. Whether we are in a pit, a palace or prison, Lord God, you are still God. And in that we give your name glory. We thank you that even when we don't know the whole plan, we can trust that you are working it out. Even when it hurts, Lord God, we can keep a perspective that lets us know that you have never left us. You have never forsaken us, Lord God, that you are making ways out of no ways, that you are turning oceans into highways, Lord God, that you are clearing out land so that it can be our territory, that we can stand there and make the declarations of faith that my God has done it before, so I know that he will do it again. My God, the same God who gave me vision to see, dreams to be dreamed, uh, uh, statements to be understood, Lord God, that regardless of where I am, he is still faithful to perform. Even when he has entrusted me with all of these things and it seems to slip away, because he's the God who's given it before, he can give it again. Because he's the God that's done it before, he can do it again. Because he's the God that has worked it out before, he can do it again. And he's already doing it. You are the God who never slumbers, who never sleeps. You sit high, you look low. You know the number of hairs that are upon our heads. So God, we thank you. I pray right now for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are trusting you, who are leaning on you, who are uh, trying to dig deeper wells of faith, Lord God. I pray that you will give us perspective to see exactly what you are doing in our lives. That when this doesn't work the way that we thought it would work, when it doesn't connect to the point that we thought it would connect to, Lord God, that the journey that you are drafting still works, that the place that you are still sending us still works. Why? Because it is all a part of your master plan. Why? Because you are the best author that there is. Why? Because you have been a God of generations and you did it for Abraham. You did it for Isaac. You did it for Jacob. You did it through 32 generations. You did it through Jesus. And here you are 2000 years later, still doing it just for us. So in that Lord God, we give your name, glory, honor, and praise. We thank you. We thank you that your presence is never too far, that we can feel your glory glory within us, that we can feel your glory in the midst of us, Lord God. We pray right now that you will throw your weight around in a mighty way, that you will settle down up in our lives, Lord God, that regardless of the posture or position that we've kept you before, that right now you will make your presence feel so strong and so heavy that we can't miss it, that we can't dismiss it, Lord God, that we cannot disapprove of it because we know it's you. We don't have to doubt it. We can trust that it's you. Lord God, I thank you for the doors that you are opening right now. I thank Thank you for the ways that you are shifting our minds right now, Lord God, that the prosperity is beginning to flow, that the favor is happening, Lord, that everywhere we go, we will be blessed. Everything we will touch will be blessed, that you will cause it all to work because it's for your riches and your glory, because it's for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Lord God, give us new perspective for our placements, that where we are is a signed space that we're allowed to occupy the space. We're allowed to walk the territory, just like the Lion King, Lord God, that from here to there, it's all yours. And if you sent us, we can be bold and going, that everything the sun touches, Lord God, it is blessed by you. And even if it's not the horizon we wanted, even if it's not the grounds we wanted, even if it's not the space we thought we would be in, Lord God, it is the presence, it is the provision, it is the position that you have placed us in. And that is more than enough. Lord, we trust you. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. We give your name glory. Forgive us for all the times we've doubted. Forgive us for the times our faith got weak. Forgive us for the times that we complained. Forgive us for the moments when we thought it was no longer in our favor. Forgive us for the times that we thought it would just be easier to walk away, to try it our own way, to do our own thing, to surrender to anything that was not you. God, forgive us. Give us hearts that are focused on you. Give us eyes that see you, minds that need you, hands that serve you, feet that follow you, Lord God, and a soul that says yes. Oh, 
a soul that says yes. That regardless of how we're introduced, regardless of what is stripped away, regardless of what titles fall down, regardless of where we are, that we know that you are faithful to perform. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, we thank you. That you're the God who turns pits into promises, palaces into purpose, and prisons into provision. Oh, God, we thank you. Mm -hmm. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Woo. I have a few announcements for you. Um, tomorrow, if you're wanting part two of this, Bible study is at the church for noon. Um, hope to see some of you there. Also, um, Brother Solitz had, has had a, a death in his family and the service is set uh, to be Monday. Um, more information will be coming about out about that via our remind system. So just stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, please keep the family lifted in your prayers. Um, and I pray that you guys are blessed, that you have a good night. We thank you for coming. We thank you for surrendering. And I pray that the word has blessed you in a way that you can apply to your life and truly be able to witness God's glory. Um, love you and good night.